So does my MS give me an advantage when it comes to being prepared for an emergency? Welcome to another edition of You and Me and Multiple Sclerosis. My name is Pam and I've been living with multiple sclerosis for 37 and a half years and probably I'll be living with it for many years to come. So I have had to learn some strategies over time for dealing with MS that I'd love to share and compare with you. And that reminds me, I sometimes forget, but I wanted to say right now, I would welcome your comments. And so any, any ideas or feedback that you have on this video or ideas for other related topics, feel free to let me know. But today I do want to talk about an, a, something that I have noticed from being out on the internet that there's a lot of interest now in what they call prepping which is basically just being prepared for any kind of a catastrophe that happens whether it be local or national or global it could take many many forms it's not even necessary to be that specific because catastrophe can be pretty limited in its scope but it's still going to be very difficult for the people that are affected by it and i would say that would go doubly for people who are dealing with any kind of chronic illness. And I remember, as many of you will, I remember the run up to Y2K, the year 2000. It was rumored that because of the way computer programs were coded, that a lot of vital systems might stop. You might remember that people were worried about everything from the power grid to airplanes falling out of the sky. And people had a wide range of reactions to this whole thing. Some people just had a very relaxed, que sera, sera kind of attitude about it. And some people were terrified. And some people made a lot of preparation for the worst case. And some people didn't. And I would have to say that at that point in my life, I had was just going to be turning 40. And my MS wasn't really all that limiting at that point. So I wasn't that concerned about it, to tell you the honest truth. My husband and I were with the ham radio organization at the time. And we volunteered to take a shift of letting the higher-ups know if there was any interruption in power or services of any kind. And given that we were on the West Coast at the time, we said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll watch the New York dropping of the ball on New Year's Eve in Times Square. And if they get through their ceremony without interruption on the East Coast, which is three hours ahead of us, we can be pretty sure that we're going to be fine out here on the west coast and as it turned out the ball came down everything was fine no lights went out everybody went on with life as normal and so we felt pretty comfortable with that so i you know as, as opposed to others who really took it seriously and worried about it i just kind of didn't but i will admit that as time has gone on and my ms has played a bigger role in my life as far as limiting what i can and cannot do and my independence I have almost naturally and imperceptibly become something of a prepper, if you'll forgive the term. I have paid a lot more attention to being prepared and thinking ahead and planning for things. So I'd like to share some of the categories of things that I think through and that I try to be prepared about. I'd be interested to know if you think I've left something out. I'd also be interested to know if the way you choose to handle these things is different from the way that I handle it. And in no particular order then, I'm just going to start telling you what I do. Okay, the first thing that I have on my list is, believe it or not, contacts. If we don't know the phone numbers of our family, friends, doctors, the local hospital emergency kinds of contacts it's always good to have that kind of list but many of us let's be honest we don't we carry it in our head or on little scraps of paper here there and everywhere but in the in a time 
where say the power goes out for more than a couple of hours or you end up having to relocate it's going to be very very important to have that list of phone numbers so i would just advise you that if you don't you go ahead and have that ready and keep it in your wallet or your purse or somewhere where it's easily accessible to you if you need to grab it quickly the second thing that you want to be thinking about is food and water and okay i'm not really necessarily talking about catastrophic emergencies here but there will be times when your caregiver needs to be gone from the house and maybe for longer than just a couple of hours i have a friend whose husband because of his work has to go away for sometimes several days so she needs to be sure that she not only has sufficient food and water in the house, but that she's able to access that and she can make some simple meals so that she can keep herself going and, <laughs> and healthy until her husband returns. It's only sensible to do that. Make a list and make sure that you get those items and have them at home and have them within reach if you can't use the stove for whatever reason, make sandwiches, do whatever, but make sure that you have the right kind of food in addition to having enough food to get by. Number three is medications. If for any reason you're not able to get out of the house or the power grid goes down or what have you, it's good to be sure that you have your medication. And if you have to leave for any reason, if you're being asked to evacuate an area because of a fire or because of a power outage or whatever, make sure that you have your medications in sufficient supply. And if there's any special care instructions for those medications, make sure that you've dealt with that too. I remember when I was taking Copaxin, you had to keep it cool. It didn't have to be chilled, but it had to be kept cool. So we tended to keep it in the refrigerator, but let's say we had to go somewhere. We would have to figure out how to pack that so that it stayed cool. Planning that ahead of time is a lot better than running around like crazy at the last minute because you hadn't thought about it ahead of time. Number four is don't assume that you have all the information you need. Many of us rely on the internet for a lot of stuff. Like, why should I keep a phone directory when I can just look up phone numbers on the internet? Well, okay, that's great when the power's out, but what if it's not for whatever reason? If you have a local power outage even, you're not gonna be able to get on the internet. So you're not gonna be able to get the information that you need. If there are certain pieces of information that you come back to again and again, you might want to just copy those off or print it out or write out the phone numbers in your address book, whatever you need to do. But make sure that there isn't anything essential on the internet that you don't have access to. One thing I know is very common these days is that many doctors and hospitals use some version of I'm my chart kind of a function where you can go out to their website and it's a password protected piece where you go in and you can actually see your upcoming appointments, your test results, your doctor's notes, whatever. You might want to make sure that if there's anything critical on there that you have a copy of it in hard copy so that you can access that even if the power goes down or the internet goes out. Because he probably figured out the power doesn't necessarily have to go out for the internet to go down. And I know how frustrating that can be. But it might be more than frustrating if there's something essential that you need it off the internet and you can't get to it. The next thing to talk about is cash. We are pretty much a cashless society now in many ways. And many people don't carry more than about $20 of cash on them. But I would suggest that if, especially if you know you're going to be alone or you're going to have to leave your home for some reason, that you have sufficient cash. Because cash is good anywhere and you just may find that you're not able to use your credit card for whatever reason. You may need it to, to access food or gasoline or any number of services or resources that ordinarily you might have used a credit card for. Next time you're at the bank, just make a withdrawal of maybe a couple hundred dollars in cash and have it in a secure place 
that you can easily access if you need it. Number five would be batteries, candles, manually operated devices instead of the electronic ones or the electric ones you had that you have relied on because perhaps you won't be able to do that if the power goes out or again if you're if you find yourself in a place where you're not have, you don't have access to the things that you tend to rely on just make sure that you have something extra because as people with multiple sclerosis we do find that our options for taking care of ourselves are a little more limited than they were before I mean, I certainly know that. I wasn't afraid of emergencies when I didn't feel as disabled as I do now because I felt like I had the wherewithal to take care of myself. Now, taking care of myself requires planning and preparation. And so having batteries around the house, having candles, having whatever else I might need, those are important things. And I will just say also that when it comes to candles, I don't know about you, but I cannot really reliably light a match. Uh, the wooden ones work better than the paper ones, certainly. But even then, I just sometimes, I don't know if my hand strength isn't what it needs to be or my dexterity, but I have trouble with matches. So I went out and made sure that I had some of those, I guess I'd call them aim flames, those. Here, I'll just show a picture of it because it's easier to show a picture than to try and explain what it is. It's filled with lighter fluid. You just pull the trigger and it gives you a flame that you can use to light candles or anything else. Maybe if you need to light the burner in your stove, they're a lot easier to control and you don't worry about burning your fingers because the match burns down <laughs> enough, which I have had happen to me more than once. I've melted a fingernail or two in my time because I just don't really have the fine motor skills and the sensations that I had in the past to keep me from hurting myself. So that's just something to think about. What are the appliances that you rely on to get your food prepared or to take care of your pet and make sure that you're able to use those even if the power is out? And then the next thing I want to talk about is the skills that you need. And I think I've more or less been hinting at that all the way through this, that there are certain skills we all need to have just to get by, and especially in an emergency. I rely on my husband a lot to do things that either are a little hard for me or uncomfortable or unpleasant, but if he's not available to help me, I need to find a way to do some of those things myself, whether it be killing a spider or giving myself an injection. Those are the things that I need to learn to take care of myself. Basic first aid is always a thing people should know, whether they're disabled or not. But certainly those of us with disabilities, make sure that your first aid kit is stocked and current and that you know where it is and that you can do basic first aid if you need to, if you cut yourself or burn yourself. And believe me, those things happen no matter how careful you think you are. Things can still happen. They've sure happened to me. I've been really grateful that I've known some things. And I wasn't joking about killing the spider because I'm not afraid of spiders, but my eyesight is not all that good. I don't judge position and distance very well. So oftentimes I try to swat a bug and I go just to the left of it. <laughs> and, then, and then it scurries away before I can get it. So I've taken up using a vacuum cleaner to get them because it's a little bit more reliable than the fly swatter I have found. And you may have a different way of dealing with it or maybe you just don't even care if the spider goes about its way and lives with you and crawls all over you and whatever. But as you can see, I'm not in that camp. So I do need to find a way to deal with bugs. And then lastly, and this is, this is the case for if you find that you have to evacuate, know where all the important stuff is. Oftentimes, we have things tucked away here and there in our homes with no real master list or one particular cupboard or shelf where important things are. And I'm talking about medications, but I'm also talking about your important papers, any kind of thing that you really want to have with you, your insurance card, if you have a driver's license, your credit card, whatever you're going to take with you, whatever you might rely on, you need to have that with you. But don't assume that you will be evacuated. I guess that's one thing that I do want to say is we learned that when we were living in upstate New York and there was a pretty major flood in town. 
a lot of the houses got badly flooded. And the fire department came around to every house and told us what our options were for evacuating. And after the firemen left, my husband and I discussed it. And we said, you know, we're on the other side of the road and we're up on this almost imperceptible little rise so that our basement wasn't taking on water. And the lawn might be a little squishy, but it certainly wasn't anywhere near flooding. And we still had power, we still had water, we still had our propane that heated our water and, and ran our stove and oven. So we thought to ourselves, okay, we have a pet. They wanted to send us to an evacuation center that where pets weren't allowed. And then there was my medicine to worry about that had to be refrigerated. There was all kinds of concern about whether I would have a harder time being away from my home and the things that I knew that I could access and use, we just ended up deciding there was no urgency in evacuating. Now, you may very well make a different decision on that. And if you do, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not recommending necessarily that you not evacuate. But if you do, think through the kinds of things that my husband and I were thinking through. Like, okay, what are we going to do with the dog if we have to evacuate? The sender isn't going to take him. Where is he going to go? Make sure that you're going to be bringing with you your medications and that you can keep them cool if need be. Make sure that you have a sufficient supply of food and your own water because who knows what you're going to find when you get to the evacuation center. All of that kind of stuff needs to be thought through. And that's basically what I'm recommending. And there you have it. There's my list. It's certainly not all-encompassing. You could flesh out any one of those categories or even add your own. And I highly recommend that you do. But you don't have to be a prepper to do some planning and, and thinking ahead. Because when you have multiple sclerosis, you're just not spontaneous. Like you might have been in the past before MS got more of a grip on your life. It's certainly been true for me. My 20s and my 30s. Even though I knew I had MS, I was still pretty much independent and did what I wanted. But now I really do have to plan more. Does that make me a prepper? Well, maybe in a way it does. But I'm probably safer for it. And I have less anxiety when things do go wrong. And that's worth it to me. But that's all I have for you today. And I really do want you to take good care of yourself. And I'll see you again in my next video. Mm -hmm.